welcome to Empowered by Iron, the podcast for female strength athletes by female strength athletes. We are your hosts, Kristen Lander from Fiercely Fueled Nutrition Coaching and Mary Morton from Silver Linings Podcast Productions. Together, we are Empowered by Iron. This week's episode is brought to you by Women's Strength Coalition. Women's Strength Coalition's mission is to build stronger communities through increased access to strength training. We envision a world where everyone has equal opportunity to express their voice and embrace their power. If you haven't already, check them out at womenstrengthcoalition.com and on Instagram at womenstrengthcoalition. They're doing some really awesome things with the strength community and Facebook group page, Women in Strength hyphen athlete resource. There's some great conversations on there with some other strong ladies. And finally, last week we dropped mugs. So if you haven't already got yours, go support Empowered by Iron and buy yourself some coffee mugs. We know you love coffee. We know you love caffeine at least. So please support Empowered by Iron and purchase a coffee mug. It'll really help out the podcast and we appreciate it. All right, to today's episode. I love I love when like first names and last names flow like that. My like Janae Marie and middle names. Yeah, yeah. first names. I love I love when like first names and last names flow like that. My like Janae middle, Marie and middle names. Yeah. yeah, first names and middle names yeah. they flow. So mm-hmm. I just thought you did that on purpose, which you probably did. But anyway, <laughs> actually, actually, the name is um, what my mom would have named me had I been born female. So that's where that came from. Awesome. Your your mom yeah. had a female name. My mom had a male yeah. name. Oh really? <laughs> mm-hmm. I was supposed to be Michael. Michael. Instead, uh, your little brother's Michael. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My mom had different sets of names picked out for all three of us, and That's both amazing. male and female. So. That's probably the yeah. smart way to be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we are just yeah. so excited for you to be on. We are. Well, We've got a bunch of questions for you, and awesome. we're hoping that there's no off limits because nope, you're um, one of the very few people who can talk about this in the industry, and so we are just fucking pumped. All right, awesome. Well, yeah, well, thanks so much for having me on. Um, I'm super happy to be joining you guys, and i um, honored that you're interested in my story, and I am totally an open book, so yeah, feel free to ask me anything at all. That's awesome. Okay. Let me say... So I'm going to just pretend that we started the podcast already. Let me okay. say that trailer for Transformer. Oh, oh my God. So good. Mm-hmm. It's just like. Oh, uh, thank you. It, it pulls at your heartstrings. I want yeah. I thought it was already out. So I was like, oh, cool. I'll watch the trailer and then I'll just watch it. And I was like. Fuck. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, everybody's. Yeah, I, I thought the trailer came out really well. I hope everyone likes the documentary as much. Um it's, I just, I've just saw the final um, edit, what, like maybe two weeks ago. And, um, you know, it's hard. It's, it's hard for me to judge it because obviously they're trying to tell the story of my life, at least over the last two years. Um, there's definitely some things I really like in it and I'm really happy with. And I, I thought they did a very good job um, showing the relationship between me and my boys. And, um, and I think that's really important because you know, we, it seems like it's always the story of, you know, how the children are estranged from the parent when you're you know, transgender and especially if you're transitioning and it's always, there's always a stereotype that the, you know, that you don't have a good um, relationship with your kids and that you can't be a good parent and that there's all these problems. And, you know, with my boys, we were very close. They've known all their lives. And um, so it was important to me that they show that because, you know, I I want that to be an example for other people to, you know, that are worried about their own children and stuff like that, that, yeah, you can have an amazing relationship and everything can continue the way it was. And, and, um, and, uh, and like, and I just think that's important for people that, you know, outside the community to see that too, because like I said, there's just always that stereotype. And I've heard that so much, like, you know, after I came out and on the forums and stuff and people are talking about it and, and people can say whatever they want about me, that doesn't bother me at all. Um, but when they talked about, you know, like how they felt so bad for my kids and what a, you know, how horrible that must be for them. And, and that, uh, you know, it was so selfish of me to do all this. Those are the things that frustrate me because that's not the situation at all. And the reality of it is my boys are all very supportive and we're very close and this hasn't changed anything at all. Um, so that, that was very important to me. And, and it was just, you know, 
um, I tried to be very open about everything and, and, uh, you know, they just basically captured my life over the last two years. And, and hopefully my, my big things are, I, I hope that it inspires people like me and I hope that it helps educate the people that don't understand. And, you know, being that I kind of come from a different background than most of your trans women, you know, being this, you know, ultra macho power lifter, ex Marine and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm hoping that it'll reach some people that otherwise, you know, wouldn't be interested in this kind of story. So, well, it seems like, yeah. you know, the media, just like you said, they, the general public likes to think that people who are transgender or who are transitioning, that they try to, um, demonize you basically. Like your whole life is just mm -hmm. this messed up thing and everyone around you is messed up. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's just not true. No, Obviously. no, no, no. I mean, trans people are like any other, you know, any other um, segment of the population. I mean, there's some of us that are, you know, really have our lives together. Some of us that don't and, and, um, you know, everywhere Reach. in between. So, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but the, but the thing is, is that, yeah, I, I really want to help try to combat these stereotypes of, you know, that we're all mentally ill and we're all perverts and, you know, it, it's in separate the, you know, the sex from the gender identity and, and all those, all that misinformation, all these myths that exist and, and um, just, just all of the stuff that has been perpetuated, you know, by the media and by different cultures and, and basically all the stuff that's wrong. I'm just... I'm a very open and honest person and I'm just a big believer in the truth. And, and even if the truth isn't always what you want to hear, that, that that's what I'm all about. So, you know, and yeah, everything isn't always roses, but I think there's just, you know, transgender people in general just get such a bad rap and, and there's so much negativity and misinformation out there. I'm just hoping that, you know, I can try to be a voice just for the truth, you know, if nothing else. Yeah. I think that people often, um, they just, because they don't understand something, then they just, don't like it or they're afraid of it or whatever. And as soon, right. as, as soon as you can, you know, know someone who's gone through this or heard someone's story, um, you start to maybe understand a little bit better. And then with understanding comes acceptance. Exactly. Exactly. And, that, and that's the thing, like it, it, it's, you know, I think that's, I hate to say it's human nature, but it's very common that um, people fear what they don't understand, you know, just like you said. And, and, um, and a lot of people don't realize how many transgender people there are and how common it actually is. And, and that's for a couple of reasons. The, the biggest reason is because it, there's such a negative stigma surrounding um, being transgender that the people that pass very well often go into what we call stealth and they you know, often move, start their lives over and um, no one even knows they're trans. And I have lots of friends like that, and I understand why they do that, and because life is so difficult um, as an openly transgender person. And I mean, it can you know affect employment, affects friendships, affects relationships, everything. And being open and honest about that, we're still at a point in our culture where it's very, very difficult. And not only you know could it get you fired or but, you know, violently attacked. And, you know, you open yourself up to abuse, especially for trans women. So because of all those things, there are so many people that live in stealth and no one has any idea that they're transgender. And also, and the completely opposite, opposite side of that, but also because of the ne negative stigma, um, you have lots of people that are still in denial or still fighting it, which, which I did for many, many years. And um, because, you, you know, you don't, you, you know, because... It, I was brought up with these same prejudices and, and, you know, and hated the way I was for so many years. And, um, you know, you fight it as long as you can. And, and you're just, and then even at the point where you accept yourself, you're still worried about, you know, how's my family going to react? How are my friends going to react? Will I lose my job? You know, all these things. And so for all those reasons, people are so afraid to be open about it and, and it's getting better. And that's one great thing about social media is that with people being able to connect and see other people, we help inspire each other to be open, to be honest and be more out about being trans. And we're seeing that a lot more, which visibility is so important. And that's one of the biggest things I, I you know, whenever the, the, we talk about percentages or the number of trans people comes up, I always say the same thing. I'm like, we have no idea how many trans people there are in the world. Not even close. We don't know because the majority of us are still hiding. And whether that's post-transition and stealth or pre-transition, still in denial and fighting who they are, there's just, I mean, thousands upon thousands of people doing that. So we really have no idea. And if everyone was visible and if you could actually see, you know, everyone that was trans and everyone was open and honest and they were free to be that way without backlash, without the stigma, 
people would be shocked. They would be absolutely shocked how many people there actually are, how common it is, and how many, and I would dare say that it, it's, it's probably highly likely that almost every single person has either met or knows someone that's trans. I mean, it's just, I mean, look at all the people in my life. I mean, for 30 plus years, no one had any idea, but yet here, you know, all my friends, family and everything knew someone that's trans and had no idea whatsoever. So hopefully we're moving in the right direction and hopefully things keep becoming more and more, you know, I guess you can say trans friendly or at least safer to be out and open. Um, you know, more and more people will keep coming out and, and eventually it'll cease to be an issue. And I, I think that's a long ways off, but I, but I also think we're moving in the right direction. And, but yeah, visibility is so important. And uh, the more people that are visible, I think the faster things will progress. Yeah, that's totally true. There's um there's a, a a woman that I follow on social media. She's um she's part of Donuts and Deadlifts. Um, I don't know if you know her, Chloe Johnson. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah, I, I met her no at the. Idea. Yeah, um, she came to. I hosted a, a women's um, lifting weekend, a women's strength weekend down in Columbus, Ohio, this summer, and she came to it. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, I, I, gosh, I hope we're talking about the same girl because I wonder if it's somebody with the same name. Where Where is she from? Um, I'm not sure where she's from, but she she works for Donuts and Deadlifts. Um, Chrissy May Cagney, they're really close. I, I oh no, to- okay, okay. I just got two people confused. Um, I have <laughs> met Chloe, and I know exactly who you're talking about. And um, I've met her, and yeah, she's the one that was the CrossFit girl, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. No, I've met Chloe. We've talked through social media. I met her at the Arnold this year. We talked a little bit. I, for one second there, I had her confused with a different Chloe, but, um, but yeah, there's a lot of them, right? There's a lot of you guys and we just don't know. Yep. Yep. And, uh, but no, I know exactly who you're talking about. Yep. Yeah. I had no idea because I was like, Mm -hmm. she was on a podcast and they talked about her being transgender Mm -hmm. and I was like, no, what? And it just changed like my whole view of everything because I'm just like everyone else. I'm stupid and uninformed and I'm getting better about it, but I was stupid and uninformed. You're just young. I'm just young. And stupid. Yeah, yeah. Let's take a step back oh. though. We sure. have not introduced mm-hmm. you at all. So hi, welcome to Empowered by Iron. We're so happy that you're on. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. This, everyone who's listening, we have Janae Marie Kroc. Um, I want to say that she's one of the pioneer women in the transgender fitness strength community, kind of paving the way and creating these avenues and conversations that have never happened really before in the strength community. And of course, she's a she's a world renowned powerlifter, all those great things that she has done. But we want to have her on today to talk about her her journey into this new world. So thank you so much for being on. Can you tell our listeners just a little bit more about you? Um, okay, well, I can just you know, give a quick background. Um, so I, I grew up um, in a, from a small uh, rural town in northern Michigan, and um, I had two strong desires from, I don't even know if desires is the right word, but um, from a very young age, I was always very passionate about strength training and always very fascinated with just strength and muscle and all that kind of stuff. And then, but then I also, I was born male and um, from a very young age, by the time I was five or six, I, oh, you know, I would daydream about being female and I would have all these thoughts and feelings and felt like I was supposed to be a woman. And it was very confusing to me. And, um, but it was, it was there all my life. And it was something that was never out of my mind for more than five minutes, but growing up when I did, you know, in the, mostly in the eighties and, and, um, in a small rural town in Northern Michigan, I I realized right away, even at a very young age, if I told people how I felt, it wasn't going to be received well. So I just buried that down, suppressed it as long as I could. And, and the thing is, I was also, you know, I was always very athletic and very into sports. Um, so, you know, I just ran with that stuff and with my passion for lifting, you know, I got into lifting weights right away. By the time I was nine years old, I was training, and, um, you know, I, I was basically like the stereotype kind of jack and, and, um, but, uh, you know, just into, played sports year round. And then, um, after high school, I went in the Marine Corps and I was actually selected for presidential security duty, um, where I, I served in DC for two years, where we did security for admirals and generals that worked at the Pentagon and visiting foreign dignitaries. And then I was assigned to, um, the presidential retreat at Camp David for two years under president Clinton. Um, 
after I got out of the Marine Corps, I um, went to college and spent six years in college and graduated um, with a degree in pharmacy and then became a licensed pharmacist. And I practiced pharmacy for 15 years. And um, during that time, I, you know, I started, like I said, I started lifting very, very young. Um, I did a couple of powerlifting competitions in high school and a couple in the Marines. But then I got real serious about it right after I got out of the Marine Corps. And this was way back in 96, dating myself here. And, um, but then I, I competed basically for close to 20 years and worked my way from the bottom of the local level um, eventually all the way up and was able to win the, um, the WPO World Championships at the Arnold Classic in 2006. And then in 2009, I, I reached my ultimate goal with lifting, which was to get the all-time world record in my weight class. And I was able to do that by um, squatting uh, 1,003, benching 738, and deadlifting 810 at a body weight of 220 pounds. Wow. And um, then after that, I, I left powerlifting and um, went to bodybuilding for a few years. And was able to win the Michigan State Championships and qualify for nationals. And then, but then at that point, um, I, was, I wanted to be the first world champion powerlifter to also get a pro card in bodybuilding. But at that point, the transition stuff was weighing on me so heavily that I was going, and for the last 10 years, I had been going back and forth about starting and stopping transition. And it had really been, I don't want to say a distraction with my lifting career, but it, it definitely made it hard. And this is stuff I'm sure we'll talk about more later, but I, you know, I had this idea, like a lot of women that, well, if I'm going to be a woman, I need to conform to these ideals. I can't be this big muscular person. And so it was this struggle for me. And initially transition would just consist of me going on a diet and trying to scale back with lifting and getting smaller. And then what would always happen right away, I would get unhappy because I would start getting weaker and smaller and then get, and then be like, well, you know what, maybe transition's not for me. And then I'd go, and of course that was the easier path too. It was to go back. Well, and at this point, you know, I was having a lot of success with lifting. I was sponsored by Muscle Tech and I was in all the magazines and um, I was sponsored by um, EliteFTS.com and and um, I was writing for T Nation. And so I was having a lot of success in the lifting arena. And, um, you know, and it was easy. It was easy to be that person. It was easy to be, you know, I was known as, um, you know, Matt, because of my long last name, which is Krajewski, I, I was known as Matt Croc. And um, so it became this persona. And it was just so easy to, you know, because everything with that was, you know, was received very positive. And, and I would, and the crazy thing is, um, you know, as far as lifting goes, I was very, I was ultra competitive. Well, I'm still am. None of that's changed, of course. <laughs> but, um, but I was ultra competitive. I, I prided myself in working really, really hard, and I and I had a high pain tolerance. And I would do all these crazy things and put myself through crazy workouts. I, I suffered a whole bunch of injuries, but was always able to recover quickly from them. And and so I was known as this like super intense, crazy lifter, kind of like this ultimate alpha male type. And um, so here's me the whole time being this transgender person. And then, but then everyone's like, oh, Matt Croc, such a badass, you know, and, and like <laughs> all this stuff. So, and I was carrying, and, and a lot of that was true. I mean, I, you know, I was, I was, you know, and was and still am a very strong person and, um, you know, and very competitive. And, and so that powerlifting suited those aspects, aspects of my personality, but then I was hiding all this stuff too. And, and about, well, it's been about a decade now, I started coming out to my close friends and family at first. And um, it was very, you know, it was very, very hard. And, and it was, I, I was, you know, very worried about how everyone would react and the consequences. And, and eventually, um, I had been out in the lifting community for a while, but then two years ago, I was publicly outed. And the reason I wasn't 100% out is because I was waiting for my boys to graduate from high school. I, I didn't, I was afraid of the repercussions they might have with their teachers and coaches and classmates. And um, I didn't want to put them through that. And even, even though I had always been honest with them and they knew about me being transgender from the time they were very little, I was afraid of how it would affect them if everyone knew. So I had, you know, decided to wait to be a hundred percent out um, until they graduated high school. But then two years ago, I got outed by a YouTuber. He made a video showing because I had had um, I had had private Facebook and Instagram pages for a while for Janae, um, and then my friends, you know, a lot of my friends and stuff were you know were aware of that and obviously interacted with me on social media, but it, they weren't public. And you know, so somehow this guy found out and um, made a video basically showing both of my Instagram pages and telling everyone, "Hey, this is Matt Crock," and and then just 
overnight my life got turned upside down. I mean, I was at work on a Monday morning and my phone started blowing up. And first it was my friends all telling me that I'd just been outed. And then it was immediately followed by texts and calls from TMZ and Inside Edition and all these people wanting interviews. And I was just like, is this for real? Like, holy cow. And then I, I just made the decision right then and there. If, if my story is going to be told, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the one to tell it. You know, I want to make sure that it's accurate and that, you know, there isn't all these, you know, rumors and myths and, and people, you know, the rumors are always 10 times worse than the truth. So I didn't want that to happen. And, um, and, I, and I wanted to be open and honest about it. And since I was already being outed and the things I had feared were going to happen anyway, I, I wanted to take as much control as I could. Um, but, in, you know, it... I mean, some, you know, it wasn't all positive. <laughs> Obviously, there, um, I lost my contract with MuscleTech. Um, they didn't renew it that year after they found out. Um, it, it definitely caused some problems for other areas of my life. Um, my fan base, all the lifters, I, it was mixed reactions. Um, there was a lot of support, actually more support than I was expecting, which was really nice. But then there was a lot of the hate that I was expecting as well. And there still is. Um, but that's, you know, people hate for many, many reasons. But... Um, but yeah, some of the messages I've got and the things people have said are can be pretty terrible. But fortunately, I'm able to. Amazing. Yeah, some of them are hilarious. I mean, some of it I love. I absolutely think it's so funny, and some of the things. And I mean, very rarely. I mean, most of it was done. I, I learned early on one thing. I joke that my success in powerlifting prepared me very well for being outed as transgender because I was already used to being talked about on forums and, and having people that had never met me hate on me and say untrue things and stuff like that. So I was already used to that. It was very easy for me to ignore a lot of like what was going on on the forums and stuff. I just stayed off of all of that because even while I could find a lot of it funny, if they started talking about my boys and got really personal, then sometimes that stuff would get to me and I, I knew it just wasn't worth it. And I, I make it a point to never argue with anyone, especially over social media, um, because I find it a very, you know, fruitless endeavor. It, it's just, you know, if you're, the second you start arguing, they're not listening to you, you're not listening to them, you, you're not going to open up conversation. Um, when I have opportunities, if people like message me privately or something, and even if they say mean things, I'll, I'll try to be very civil and open a dialogue. And a number of times, a lot of times I'm able to talk to them and, and get them to see a perspective they've never seen before. And then sometimes if they do post something nasty on one of my pages, I'll, I'll, it, it, a lot of times, like I said, I find them very, very funny. And um, I'll post a funny comment back. And a lot of times that catches them off guard. They're not expecting that. They're expecting me to be angry and upset. And if I can joke about it, then they, you know, they're kind of caught off guard. And then that, sometimes that can open you know, a, a way to have some dialogue. So it can be a really good thing. But, um, but yeah, it, it's just, you know, at this point, I'm... Um, just trying to take my life in a new direction. I'm, I'm really getting into the activism and public speaking. I've been speaking at colleges and universities and trying to schedule, you know, more talks like that. Um, you know, we've got the documentary coming out. Um, I'm also working on a book. And um, so really just, you know, moving in that direction and, and trying, and I'm still involved with the lifting. I'm still coaching lifters and writing programs and diets and stuff like that. And I'll always train myself, although I've probably done competing, but, um, but uh, I'll still stay involved in all the lifting stuff as well. So, yeah, so that's where everything's at now. My my oldest son's in college, and my youngest two are both in high school, and they're doing very well. And, and um, fortunately, me being outed really didn't have any negative effects on them. And it's actually helped them um, explain stuff to a lot of other people because it's open conversations with some of their friends and, and stuff like that. So all in all, it, it's, you know, it's been tough, but, it, but really it, it's been a blessing in disguise. So many things to discuss in that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. first, when I was doing a little bit extra research, because I, I love podcasts and I noticed you were on a couple of them, so I listened to a few mm -hmm. of them. And some videos, some YouTube videos popped up, and one of them popped up was this guy ranting about, well, uh, Janae came out because um, Caitlyn Jenner came out as transgender. She's just <laughs> trying to dr get on the coattail. I was like, really? Yeah. You think this person just was like oh okay well Caitlin is doing it so uh, all right I'll just do it and try to get famous like really yeah yeah that's the absurdity that that it's so absurd that anyone would put themselves through all of this if they saw like right. I mean like I said like muscle tech dropped me like instantly and, and, the, and the funny thing was that actually happened right before I got outed because they found out a couple months before I got publicly outed when they asked me about it I was totally honest about it 
And then they basically said, you know, well, we understand, but we feel it'd be, it's bad PR. So, um, you know, we're, they pulled all my content off all their websites immediately, canceled all my appearances for that year. And then basically said, we'll pay you through the rest of your contract, but we won't be renewing it. And, you know, it was one of those things that, I mean, while it was basically straight up discrimination, it, it's a little <laughs> different than a up. lot of cases. Yeah. I mean, it was, they didn't even make any qualms about it. Yeah. They're like, oh, you're transgender. Oh, we can't have that. Like it wasn't <laughs> even, yeah. But, but the thing was too, it was different than like, you know, being fired from like a pharmacy job or something like that because I was hired to represent their company. You know, I was hired as an athlete to represent their brand. And I felt, well, if they, if they felt that that's not how they want their brand represented, that that's their option. Even though obviously I didn't agree with the decision and I thought it was a poor decision, I still felt like, you know, but that's their decision to make. And even though I feel like they're gonna be on the wrong side of history, I, I understood that, you know, that's, that's how they wanted their brand represented. And I understood about them not wanting to, you know, renew my contract. Um, and that, but that's totally different than someone having, you know, a job where you're not the face of a, you know, of products and, um, you know, being fired because people just don't like it. That, that's totally different. Right. So but, wait, um, are, you, are you telling me that a transgender person can be logical and rational because you sound like you're very <laughs> rational about this and very confused? <laughs> I try to be. I try to be. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing too. It's like we get this bad rap as all these, you know, whiny, um, neurotic, uh, you know, people that are, you know, just looking to, you know, complain about how people treat us and that, um, you know, we're, you know, it's that whole that whole stereotype, that whole stigma of what people perceive trans people to be. You know, there's a couple things that always get thrown out there. Um, we're mentally ill. We're all mentally ill. We're all crazy. Obviously. We're delusional. Yes. And um, and then, uh, yeah, never mind all of the success and all the people that are trans that have done amazing things. I mean, there's, you know, directors Forget in Hollywood. That. Yeah, Not yeah. important. Nope. We're all crazy. We're just a bunch of nuts <laughs> running around. And, and we have our, our transgender. We want to destroy the family unit, take over the country. <laughs> And uh, me, me and my boys love to joke about that all the time. Oh, and, my God. Uh, a transgender? Yes, yes, like yes. The yes. title We're, of your podcast. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> the, the transgender. Yes, we, we are going to destroy the family unit, and uh, we want to destroy all the men in the world. And I don't know. There's all kinds of crazy stuff I've seen. It, it's pretty hilarious, actually. But, um, well, but no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm the type of person, I try to see everything from, you know, through other people's eyes too. And, and I understand if you've never been exposed to this and I know the way I was raised and the way I was brought up in a small conservative town, I thought very negatively of it, even though it was me when I was young, because that's what I was taught. So I understand where, you know, people can have those bias because that's how they were raised or that's how they were taught to believe. But then, you know, at some point in our lives, I hope, at least I hope most of us question those beliefs and question what we've been taught. And at that point, we start trying to make our own decisions and, ba and hopefully base everything off of the available evidence and say, well, does that make sense? You know, I've been taught this all my life, but is that really the truth? And, and that's, you know, where you kind of really start figuring things out and hopefully move forward. And, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I try to be rational when I can. <laughs> so you mentioned that you, um, so basically muscle tech was just like, no, we don't, we don't want you to be the face of our company anymore, which I agree. I think mm -hmm. is, um, I think they really could have done some amazing things with it, but oh, well, that's, that's yeah. but, um, did you have any trouble at work because of it or did they um, not? Well, I was, oh, that's okay. That's a kind of a complicated question. Um, you don't have to answer so it. <laughs> I, yeah, it, it's, well, I can't talk a lot about it, but let's just say that, um, I'm no longer working in pharmacy and, um, I had told them a long time ago and they knew prior to me being outed, but it, it, uh, but once see, it became I, public, it was, was kind of like, well, it was just, just things. I thought things were better than they were, I guess, put it that way. And then things developed to basically, I'm no longer working in pharmacy, but that's okay. But um, I, I can't talk about everything, I guess, is the okay. right that's now. Fine. So. That's fine. We respect but, yeah. that. Um, and then I just want to go back to this YouTuber that outed you. I mean, what in the hell is wrong with this person? Like, what? Like, what? Yeah. What is wrong? Like, what is wrong with someone that makes them feel like they need to out someone? You know, I that's, mean, a, for, for that's a crazy. 
that's a crazy thing. I had never heard of the guy before this, but I, from what I understand, um, he runs a YouTube channel that's kind of like a gossip channel for bodybuilding and powerlifting, strength sports. And so for him, I guess, you know, this was just a way to get views. And um, I mean, it worked because the, it went, it quickly went viral. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, um, you know, the thing is, the, the thing that bothered me most, I didn't feel like he was super, I mean, obviously I watched the video to see what was posted. Um, but uh, he wasn't like super malicious. He, he didn't do it in a real negative light. Like he didn't, you know, attack me as this horrible person or, you know, claim I was, you know, mentally ill and all that kind of stuff. He simply, but he outed me, but was very kind of matter of fact, like, okay, here's Matt's page, here's Janae's page. Um, you can see they're both the same person. It, what do you guys think? So it, it was totally just a way to get views and, you know, and get traffic to his channel. And I just don't think people like that realize, you know, what they're doing to someone's life. And, and for me, like I said, I can handle anything. It, it's whatever. You can say whatever you want about me and you can be as mean as you want. You can say nasty things. It's not going to bother me one bit. But the thing that bothered me in his video, he pulled up some pictures that I had on my map page of me and my sons. And this was part of the video and like had their pictures up and it's like, oh, here's, here's him with his children. And I, and I was just thinking, why did you have to do that? You know, that, that, that really bothered me. Um, but, um, and if I ever meet him in person, I'm sure I'll have a few words for him. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, I didn't feel like it was super malicious. It was just, um, but doing, but outing someone, I mean, that's just a horrible thing to do because you have no idea the effect you're having on their life. Unfortunately, in my position, it didn't put me in danger, but a lot of people by outing them, you could put their life in danger. You yes. know, it, it's, and that's what people don't realize, like never, ever out anyone. Um, even, I mean, like, and that's what I've, I've told people too, like, maybe you realize someone's trans that maybe you bump into them, like in the grocery store all the time or something like that but you don't know them and you don't know their background and, but you want to be supportive. I, I just always caution, like the one thing, be very careful not to out them. You don't know if they're out and you could be trying to be supportive and say something, but maybe out them in front of like a, a coworker that could get them fired. You could out them in front of someone that, you know, maybe would, you know, be violent against them. You, you never know. So you have to be very, very careful about that kind of thing. And, mm -hmm. and, um, people just don't realize like they don't they don't understand that um you know the seriousness of it and the repercussions and um it's not like it, it's not like you know spreading some gossip about one of your friends which that's horrible enough and, and people shouldn't do that either but but outing someone like i said you, you not only could you cost them their employment and and um but the biggest thing you could be putting their life at risk. And, and, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that, like some people think, Oh, those trans people being dramatic again. And no, it, that's for real. I mean, trans women get murdered all the time and it, it's not, it's not an exaggeration to say that. And, um, and I don't, and that's one thing I want people to understand. Like you don't realize like being a non-passing trans woman, just existing it can open you up to violence. And, right. um, you know, it happens all the time. And it, it's a very sad thing. And it's mostly due to ignorance and hate that stems from that ignorance. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the bottom line, never, ever, ever out <laughs> anyone because you don't know what could happen. Right. Well, and um, to that tune, there was that whole, the whole bathroom debate um, and everyone mm -hmm. got all up in arms. Um, I think that was mostly North Carolina, yeah. right? Which we're in South Carolina, yeah. but oh, it's like, like <laughs> you better. already used the bathroom with a trans person mm -hmm. and didn't know it. And I promise you, they were probably more afraid than you would have been, you know, like, yeah. it's not. Yeah. Well, the, the, yeah, the whole thing is they turned it into an argument that it wasn't. I mean, they, you know, the thing is they throw out there and I had posted about this on some of my social media and stuff. Um, but they, they throw the thing out there about the children and nothing gets people worked up oh. more than, you know, if your children's is safety is threatened. And I understand that I'm a parent. I have three boys. And if someone threatened my children, there's nothing in the world that would stop me from harming them. But, um, but so I get that. But, but the thing is that was a non issue. You were talking right. about something that has never happened. Right. There has never been a case where a transgender woman has assaulted any children. And, and, the, and, the, and the thing is, if you step on the surface, you know, they, they pass this idea of men sneaking into the women's restrooms. And that, that is not the case at all. It's, you know, 
trans women have been using women's restrooms forever and no one's even aware of it. And even when they are, like you said, it's the trans woman that's wants to get in and out. And you would not believe the lengths we go to, to avoid using the bathroom in public for the girls like me that don't pass. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's always a nerve wracking experience. You never know. I mean, I, fortunately I've never had any issues. I, I've gotten some, especially early on, um, early on, like, yeah, my makeup skills and fashion sense was not nearly as good as it is now. And um, I'm sure I was a sight to see. And um, I would only ever use the restrooms if I was with a group of my girlfriends, and there was a bunch of us. And even then, I tried really, really hard to avoid. But if you're out for a long period of time, sometimes you just have to do that. And, um, and using the men's restroom, you're, you're just asking for violence. I mean, there's no place where you're putting yourself in more danger by going into a small isolated room you know, like a restroom and, you know, that, that's, that, that is a good way to get yourself attacked. Um, but, uh, and there's trans women that have been attacked in the women's restrooms and beaten too when people have discovered, but, um, but yeah, the whole issue with like child molestation and stuff, first of all, the, the majority of your child predators are straight males. Um, it, you know, the whole idea that, you know, especially like that's another myth that's been perpetuated is the idea that it's gay men that do this. No, it, it's males, typically straight males, or, or men that identify as straight that assault children mm -hmm. and they typically assault males. And that's the other thing, like this whole issue doesn't even make sense because adult males are already have access to um, young males in the restroom. I mean, right. that, that's, if that was your concern, that's already going on. And the thing is, is sexual predators, that's not where they're looking for kids. Very rarely are young. I mean, there's a whole bunch of reasons why this whole thing is completely absurd. Right. But the thing is young children are rarely alone in restrooms. It's not a place where predators are typically looking because anyone can walk in at any second. I mean, you know, predators are looking for kids at parks and, you know, they get involved Walking with home jobs. Alone that gives them or something. Yep. Home alone. Yeah. I was actually approached by me and my brother were approached by a man when we were young kids and he offered us candy and tried to get us into his car. I mean, that's what they do, you know, and, and, um, you know, walk around with puppies and things like that. But, but this whole idea of trans women assaulting children, it, it was completely absurd. It was drummed up by the people who, you know, are transphobic. And, yep. but yeah, it scared a lot of people right off the bat because you, you know, you threaten children. Oh my God, let's keep these freaks out of there. We got to keep our children safe. And, um, but it's stuff like that. It, it's the propaganda and the lies and, you know, all that. Unfortunately, a lot of people saw through that, but a lot of people didn't. And, yep. you know, and, it scared a lot of people. And I understand on the surface how people could be like, oh my God, yeah, my kids, oh no, I don't want them in there. You know, I got to keep my kids safe. I get that. But that's where we need to step back and look at everything from a rational perspective and say, is this really an issue? You know, okay, how many times has this happened? You know, what are the cases? And, and the amazing thing in this, it's never happened. Never. Not and not once. And, um, and then, um, you know, but, but then we want to talk about there's more U.S. senators have assaulted people in restrooms than trans women right. have. Oh. You know, but uh, but where's, the, where's the ban for the U.S. senators in uh, restrooms? And, uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's just, it's absurd. And the real threat to our children, there, there are threats out there, but this isn't one of them, you know, right. so. If anything, it just gave those fucked up people an idea. Like, come on. Right. Yeah. I gave them an idea. Yeah. They had been doing yeah. this for years. Yeah, uh -huh. it's yeah, crazy, crazy. So you said something um, in one of your Instagram posts a while back that I, I just really, really spoke to me and I think would speak to a lot of our listeners. So I want to, I just want to kind of paraphrase part of it, but you mm -hmm. said, um, don't let anyone make you feel like there's something wrong with you because they don't have the ability to understand you. And I think that that mm -hmm. is something that is very true for trans women and just women in strength sports in general, right. sometimes mm -hmm. get a lot of flack too, but um, that was just such a powerful statement. Thank you. Yeah, that's just something. I mean, you know, that that's one thing. After after I was outed and I, I came out publicly and started to getting to know a lot of the women from the strength world a lot more. Um, the funny thing is, I've been in the sport, you know, for a couple decades, and I, and I knew some of the strongest women, but we I was but I was never really close to them. You know, we, I would see them at competitions, and I was sponsored with some of these girls, and I, and I would even say I was friends with a handful of them but not in the way like girlfriends are friends. You know, mm -hmm. I, I was never able, and there was times I really wanted to open up to some of them and, but I knew I'd be outing myself by doing so. And then some of them did know, but it wasn't like we were close enough to really talk about things. But then once, but once I was fully out and I started getting to know a lot of these girls better, 
I started reeling like, oh my God, they struggle with a lot of the same things I do, which mostly being wanting to be big and strong, but yet maintain your femininity as if they're mutually exclusive. Oh, you can't be a woman if you're big and strong, or, you know, it's somehow the, the opposite of, of being feminine, which is completely absurd. But yeah, and then, you know, and this idea too, like with my post, and, and like I said, never let anyone make you feel like there's something wrong with you because they don't understand you. It's because, yeah, I mean, you know, you, someone sees a muscular woman, that's the first thing they say, oh, she looks like a man or this or that. Well, you know what? People are going to hate on you for a lot of different reasons and never let that affect you. Don't let it determine what you do or how you live your life because you're worried about what other people are going to say because other people are going to say what they're going to say no matter what. And I, and I can tell you, even from when I was the world champion powerlifter, ex-Marine badass that all these people loved, other people still hated me. You know, there was still like, there's still going to be hate and people would come up with ridiculous reasons or, you know, even lies and stuff. But th some people are always going to dislike you. That's just, it's human nature and it's going to happen. And if you live your life trying to please other people, you're going to be miserable. And not only are you going to be miserable, you're going to be unsuccessful anyway. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, no matter what you do, someone's going to find fault with it. So you're much better off to be you, do what makes you happy, and don't worry about what anyone else thinks about it. And I know that's so much easier said than done, but there's so much truth in that. And even even I still work on that on a daily basis. Um, I mean, for the large, for the most part, I do a really, really good job at, you know, being comfortable in my own skin now and um, being comfortable with who I am. But it, it still gets to me. There's days, you know, there's times where I'm going to go out and, um, you know, I'm about to put on makeup or wear a certain thing. And then I think, well, I'm going to the auto parts store. That's going to make things more awkward. And, you know, and, and it's just, and it's, it's easier because I, I do still live in both genders and not everyone realizes that. And, um, and, um, but I, I'm still like, I, like I said, I also identify as gender fluid and um, non-binary. So I, I don't know that I can say that, I, I completely fit into one gender. I think for me, it's much more complicated than that. Now, if you only give me two options and force me to pick one, I, I definitely identify stronger as a female, but I'm a very complex person and it, I don't think it's, it's not that simple for me. I can't just say, oh, I'm just a girl like all these other women and, you know, and that, and that is, would be 100% accurate for me. Um, mm -hmm. I think my, my experience is a little more complicated, but, um, but I definitely, I mean, in some of my girlfriends, I mean, oh, we talk about lifting and, you know, the perceptions and being muscular and all this stuff. And, it, and it's like when I first started talking to some of the girls in the strength world about this, it, it was it was just it was so nice because I was like, oh, my God, they get it. Like, this is mm -hmm. the same stuff I struggle with. And, and it, it was like hearing myself talk when I would listen to them. So that, yeah, in that sense, I mean, 100 percent relate and they relate to me. And, and it, it's just, you know, yeah, it, it's. It was really, really nice, you know, when I came out and got to be closer with these women. And, you know, I have so many close girlfriends now that um, I can share all this stuff with and and uh, we get it. And it's nice because you, you need that support because and not only is it, you know, um, men that are like, oh, she looks terrible, you know, because I mean, right. How many guys? It's all about what they find attractive. Right. They feel like right, every woman in the world matters. is. Yeah. Everyone in the world is supposed to be pretty for them. Like it, it just it never ceases to amaze me all the messages and stuff I get like, well, I like you better with this hair or I like you better like this. I think you should be more muscular. I think you should be less muscular. <laughs> you know what? It's like, well, thanks, but it, it doesn't matter what you think. It, it's my life. And, uh, you know, what you think is really irrelevant, you know, and unless I'm in a relationship with you, I really don't care. So and, is... um, and even, it, yeah. And even then that's, it's still, it's more, it's about what makes me happy, you know? So so this is so interesting to me. And I wonder if when you, like before you transition, did you experience this as a male? Like, did, I feel like this is something, because this is something as women we experience. Like some days I dress like a little bit more. I mean, I just dress like a little, I don't know, not as feminine. Here's Other days I, like, I dress more mm -hmm. feminine. And, 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 mm -hmm. and people, and sometimes like, oh yeah, they say things like, oh, I liked it better when you were a little leaner. I like you curvier. I like, it's like, what? Like what, what? what gives you the right to say that? Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like, would you walk up to, yeah. Would you walk up to some guy at work and be like, dude, I liked you so much better when you were 20 pounds lighter. Like, right, you know, yeah. like, you know, who would say that? You don't even think to say that. And, but with women, it, it's just like, yeah, like we're like, 
our job is to look attractive for them. And they, and a lot of guys don't even understand that they're, that what's wrong with it and what they're doing. And it, it's just ridiculous. And, it, what do you, and, and the other thing too is, and, uh, and to get, answer your question before we keep moving forward here. Um, no, as a male, I mean, I had things happen. I, I was, you know, I was, I had been sexually harassed a few times and stuff by both men and women. And, um, but that's totally different than being harassed as a woman. And it's, and it was totally different um, the way I'm treated as a woman versus how I was treated as a man. Um, it, it's, and that's what people don't understand. Um, because, uh, oh gosh, I, I read something earlier today. I'm trying to remember exactly how it went because they made a really, really good point. But I mean, there's a couple of factors that are completely different. I mean, I, obviously no one should be sexually harassed. And even as a male, when I was harassed, it was extremely uncomfortable. But one of the big differences, I never felt, you know, physically um, uh, threatened. I, I never, I didn't feel like I was in danger. Whereas a woman, that it's completely different. And, um, and, and also it, it's just, um, as a woman, how you're expected to handle that is completely different than as a male. And uh, it's a completely different experience. And, and then no one, if a, if a guy is sexually harassed, no one asks, what were you wearing? You know, what did you say? You know, why, you know, and no one's blaming them for it. But with women, the second that comes up, somehow the woman who's, who's the victim is, is being blamed. And as if you, you, whatever clothes you chose to wear gives someone the right to treat you that way. And, and that's completely absurd. And unfortunately, that's opened up a lot more conversation about those things. And it's becoming a lot more talked about. And I think people are, are getting it. But it's a completely different experience. And, um, but yeah, it just, it, it really opened my eyes after I was first outed because then all of a sudden I had all these messages and, and it was always private messages and stuff. Um, but all the, yeah, of course. And I, I'm sure you guys have seen all the same stuff, but yeah, you would not believe the volume of dick pics that made their way to my <laughs> inbox. The, um, which I, I never understood. I still don't get that to this day. Like what goes through a guy's head that thinking by sending you a picture of his penis is going to be somehow like, you're going to be like, Oh my God, thank you. That was so awesome. Like, like, like that was the yeah, best yeah. thing I've ever seen. Like, yeah. Like it, it's just so weird to me. And, um, even though like, you know, I said, like I lived, you know, as a male for the first three decades of my life, there were a lot of things I didn't get. Um, I, I really didn't understand how most men related to women and um, relationships and stuff, even though I was attracted to girls, um, I, I didn't, I, I never felt comfortable in the male role. That was very awkward for me. And, um, and I couldn't understand what other guys would, you know, like the locker room talk. I, I could never relate to that. I couldn't understand it. And to this day, I still don't. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> But, um, but so in a lot of ways, like, like I said, I was fine with the sports and doing like, quote unquote, guy things, which really, which baloney. I mean, you know, what, what's a guy thing? Oh, well, sports, lifting, bull crap. Lots of girls like that stuff too, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a guy thing, definitely. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, so, but I had been conditioned too to believe that, because a lot of things I liked, I was into, you know, lifting, which was supposed to be a manly thing. I was into sports, which was supposed to be a manly thing. I was into, you know, classic muscle cars and, and still am. And so, you know, so I had all these things telling me, oh, no, you're a boy, you're a boy, you're supposed to do this, you like these things. That means, and I would literally sit down and make these long lists and I would have, you know, like why I should be male, why I should be female. And I would, and I would tally all these things. And looking back, it was so ridiculous because 90% of what was on those lists had nothing to do with being male or female. Yeah. It was simply society's stereotypes of what a man or woman is supposed to be. And which is completely absurd, yeah. you know, completely arbitrary and subjective. And, um, but, uh, but yeah, getting, getting back to all the, the sexual harassment stuff and, it, it's been crazy. It really has. And it, it's died down some because, you know, I've ignored so much of it or shut so much of it down. But but it, it was really an eye-opening experience just to see, like, how aggressive males could be. Like, the guys that would, you know, try to call you through Facebook Messenger and get angry when you didn't answer their calls. And this would be some guy from a different country who has no idea who I even am. But he's calling me repeatedly. My phone keeps going off and I keep hitting end, end. And then he's sending me nasty messages. Why won't you answer my call? I'm trying to talk to you. And I'm thinking, dude, I have no interest in talking to you whatsoever. What Why would fuck, you? Man? Yeah, like what is going on? But it happened so much that it really opened my eyes to how commonplace that kind of attitude is. 
and just how like there are so many guys out there that think somehow women owe them something and yeah. um yeah it's it's completely absurd and it's really sad and and um I, and I hope i'm able to bring conversation to things like that too um but i i feel very fortunate that i you know having seen both sides of you know having lived in both roles and and still do to some degree i mean even my my male version at this point is pretty blurry <laughs> like you know it's uh <laughs> but um but yeah it, it was an, it was an eye opening experience for sure well you get it i mean you have now experienced both sides and most most men will never understand what it feels like when you're sitting there in a room with someone who's supposed to be your significant other and they make a comment about someone on TV and you're like, it's not their fault that this happened or why would you bring that up or, you know, something that. Yeah. 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 And they just, they really just don't get it. Like sometimes I try to explain to some of my male friends, sometimes these conversations will come up and, and I'll, and I'll try to get them to understand. And, and sometimes I'm able to, sometimes I'm able to help them see a different perspective. And sometimes they just look at me like, no, like I don't get it at all. And, and it's like, yeah, you don't get it. You have no idea what that's like. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I had one experience and I've talked about this a couple of times. Um, I, I was almost jumped in a parking garage. It, it didn't happen. And most likely it didn't happen because of how muscular I am. It's probably the only thing that prevented it from happening. Um, but I was followed out of a club one night by five guys and I wasn't even aware of it until I got to my car mm -hmm. Fortunately, I got to my car a little bit ahead of them, but when I shut the car door, they were standing right outside my door. And it was like, you know, 3 a.m. in the parking garage. And this was in Ann Arbor, which Ann Arbor in the Midwest is about as, you know, LGBT friendly as mm -hmm. you can be. And, um, and it's not a place that you typically think you worry about things like that. But I, I was leaving a popular club and the parking garage was only one block away. And normally I go, you know, I would go out with friends, but this time no one could go out. So I went by myself and, but I had no idea they were even following me until I shut the car door. And the guy was literally standing right outside my window and four of his buddies were right behind him. And from growing up and the way I did, I, I know the look guys have on their face when they want trouble. And that's, you know, and I, and, but the scary part was I never saw them come in. I didn't hear them behind me. I don't know how long they'd been following me. And um, fortunately, you know, I, you know, as soon as, as soon as I shut the door and saw him standing there, I nonchalantly locked the doors real quick, started my car and hurry up and backed out. And they, they just stood there and stared at me and gave me dirty looks like as I pulled away, but they didn't do anything, fortunately. But, um, but the thing was prior to that, especially being a big, strong, muscular male, I had never, ever worried about my safety anywhere. And I had, you know, I had spent time when I was in the Marines, I was in Southeast DC and, you know, I'd been in a lot of big cities with not so nice neighborhoods and, and um, never, ever thought about those things once. And, um, and then, uh, you know, hiccup to me, like how I had to be much more aware of my surroundings as a woman, especially as a trans woman, that now I'm much more of a target than I've ever been in my life. So that, that was a, a real wake up call for me. That's yeah. so, I mean, that's just what women deal with. It's terrifying. Well, mm -hmm. I think probably yeah. more targeted as a, as a trans woman, for sure. You probably get it multi, you know, you probably get like a hate angle that we don't necessarily get. We just get a angle of like, Hey, I want to overpower someone or whatever, but right right That's yeah and, and, and yeah there's some truth to that because it is it's the anger and like i said i saw the look in their eyes and it was the um you know it, it was the they were looking for trouble and it, it was i'm sure like i mean i was wearing it was a warm summer night i was wearing this really cute dress it was spaghetti <laughs> strapped and knee length and i had like you know five inch heels on and not optimal fighting gear by any means <laughs> no and um but um but i'm sure with my body and everything I stood out right away and, and they realized, you know, that, that I was trans. And like I said, I, I really think the only thing that prevented them from doing anything was they also saw how muscular and big I was and were probably kind of debating, like, mm, is this worth the trouble? You know, right. and it, it made them hesitate enough to, to where nothing happened. But I, I was very fortunate. And um, but yeah. And then, yeah, of course, when I told all my girlfriends about it afterwards, they were like, oh, my God, what were you thinking? You don't go walking like that. You know, alone late at night. I'm like, oh my god! Like I never really thought about that before. I, I never <laughs> you had your to. Ass handed to you. They were like, "What yeah. were you thinking?" <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And okay. um, mm -hmm. I have, okay. Let's go. Let's go back to something else. Mm -hmm. I have a question about. So we've been saying that you are a transgender woman, 
but you also mm -hmm. said that you um, identify as um, gender fluid and non-binary. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, it's complicated. And a lot of these terms have really just come about the last couple of years. And, and it's really just a means of ways for people to describe themselves. Um, because it's not, you know, for someone, you know, um, a lot more people are becoming familiar with it, but cisgender just refers to anyone who's basically comfortable with the gender they were born. So their sex and their gender identity match. And um, so for someone who's never ever thought about it or never questioned anything, it, it you know, it all seems really confusing. And the other thing is, it's not as simple as, um, you know, especially for me and for a lot of people, but yeah, I'm not the stereotypical girl trapped in a boy's body. It wasn't that simple for me. And that's why I've struggled with a lot of back and forth and, you know, and you can describe it a lot of different ways. I mean, in some ways I, I, I can relate to guys, but then I wonder, well, it, am I really relating to guys or I'm just a really competitive athletic girl that was able to relate to guys? that way. I, I don't know. You know, it's hard to say because I was socialized as a male for three decades. Right. So it, it's hard to say whether, you know, really I, you know, um, there are differences in the male and female brains and they, and they've found a number of differences and there's, we still need a lot more research in that area, but I, I know I'm sure certain my brain has some of those differences because obviously that's why I never felt comfortable in my own skin. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, have all the feelings that I do and, and, um, but, uh, but basically to answer your question. So gender fluid basically means anyone that, moves along the gender spectrum. And and the thing is this and you were just mentioning a little while ago, like some days you feel like dressing more masculine or some days more feminine. And and that's totally it for me too. And and that's another thing that makes it more complicated for me because I'm still very muscular, even though I'm not nearly as much muscular as I used to be. And, and that's something I question a lot lately too. It's like why did I give up all that muscle? Do, did I really need to? I, I was trying to conform to society's expectations of what a woman is. And after, I mean, I lost, so initially when, when I was outed, I decided that, okay, I'm going to transition now. Like the whole hiding's all done. So, okay, full steam ahead. I, I went from 272 pounds all the way down to 200, which wow. 200 still a pretty muscular woman, uh, you know, by most people's standards, but I lost 72 pounds of muscle. And then I got down there and then I started getting really unhappy. I had lost so much strength. I lost so much size. And yeah, I mean, there was things like, oh, I can pull this outfit off or, you know, this outfit that I couldn't before. But then again, I couldn't. Why? Because I didn't see myself as what society told me I'm supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. So I, I couldn't wear that dress because my arms were too big. Well, who says what's too big? At yeah. what point does a muscular arm become too muscular? You know, it, it's completely arbitrary and, it, and it, everyone's opinion is totally different. And um, so now, like, now, you know, I still think about, like, well, gosh, do I, I mean, and, and I've gone back up some. I mean, right now, I think today I'm sitting around 228 pounds. And, um, but I still think, like, gosh, I miss being stronger and bigger than I am. But then the bigger I get, the harder it is to blend in when in society, and it causes more issues. And it's not as much that I'm not comfortable, but there, there's still some of that too. I mean, I, you know, I do the whole thing too. Like I put on, I'll put on one dress. Nope. Take it off. Nope. Not wearing that today. Change this outfit, change that outfit. But it, it's so hard for me to separate with what I feel good in versus what I feel other people will think I look good in. Yeah. And yeah. you know, and it, it just, and it complicates my life. And, and it's just like, especially in situations um, like if I'm pulled over by the police or um, going through security at the airport, I'm passing through customs, traveling to another country, then it's always like, oh, you know, how do I present today? Do I try to butch it up and look more male? Do I, do I try to go more ultra femme? Would I have a better chance of passing that way? You start thinking about which way is going to cause me the least hassle, which way am I likely to be the least harassed? And, and I've been lucky. I haven't had any real bad experiences yet. I, I had one police officer question my ID because in, in my IDs, you know, I, I'm presenting very feminine and I'm wearing makeup and, and um, I was um, pulled over this summer and um, no makeup on looking very, very masculine. And um, when I handed him my ID, um, he, he almost like laughed at first and he's like, come on. He's like, whose idea is this? And I'm like, it's mine. And, and, um, and he's like, what? he's like, you cut your hair and then he's looking at it closer. And, and I, and then immediately said, I said, no, I'm, I'm transgender slash gender fluid. I said, 
I, I kind of live in both gender roles and I'm like, but it is me. And I'm like, I have an older ID if you want to see it. And then, and at that point he was like, no, 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 I, uh, that's fine. Um, but you know, I was, I, I was very worried before that ever happened that I would, you know, I would get a cop that's transphobic or something like that would cause me a lot of trouble because that has happened to people. And, um, Fortunately, I haven't had that experience. Most of my, I mean, I've been, you know, I've been pulled over a handful of times in the last couple of years, usually for speeding. I, I have a little bit of a lead foot. I was and, like, what um, are you doing, Janae? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Janae likes fast cars. And, uh, and um, Kristen likes fast cars, too. Oh, awesome. And uh, oh, like talk, about, speed, talk, talk about that later. <laughs> and, uh, oh, I got, I got pulled over three times in one day, long, 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 long time ago, and actually got out of all three tickets. But uh, you smart, but, naughty yeah. people. Yeah. Bad. <laughs> but. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but going through, like, I'll be traveling to Austin um, next week for the film festival. And it is, it's a concern. Like, I, I think a lot about how am I going to dress to go through TSA. And especially when I'm traveling to someplace like Texas, even though Austin is very LGBT friendly. Um, I do know one friend that was harassed at the Austin airport. And um, so it, it's always, you know, it's always a concern. It's always a thought. And, you know, how do I look? And if I was more passable, you know, if I was smaller and less muscular, you know, I, I'd probably, it'd be less hassle for me. It'd be easier, but then, but you, you never know. And um, the other thing is too, I don't like, I don't like feeling, feeling vulnerable. And I, I grew up, I was very, ironically enough, I was very small and skinny as a child and I had to work really, really hard to get bigger. I mean, I played freshman football at 118 pounds Wow. and, um, and yeah, I would have had no trouble. It's a shame I, I wasn't comfortable with who I was back then. I would have had no trouble passing. And uh, I had this little baby face and almost no, you know, very, I wasn't hairy at all. And, and, um, but, uh, but yeah, I worked really, really hard to get big. And, um, but when I was small and skinny, I, I, I didn't like feeling vulnerable. I got bullied. I got bullied a little bit, like when I was younger, especially like in junior high. And it wasn't anything horrible, like a lot of people go through, but it was enough. There was a couple instances where I was threatened by bigger, older, stronger kids, and it scared me, and, and I hated it, and I hated feeling vulnerable like that, and I, I hated not, you know, feeling like I wasn't able to protect myself or knowing if something happened, I was probably going to be on the losing end of it, and that was one thing that surprised me that I had forgotten about from being, I mean, for almost a 20-year period, I was 250 pounds or better of muscle. So I had forgot what it felt like to feel vulnerable. When I got down around 200 pounds, and even though 200 is not, you know, that small, um, I started feeling vulnerable again, and I didn't like it. It, it, it. I didn't like how I felt. And, and I noticed how people reacted differently towards me, and it started changing mm -hmm. interactions. And um, so there was a lot of mixed emotions with it, and it was difficult. And uh like I said, I still now, like, I, I still think all the time about, you know, getting bigger and stronger again, closer to where I used to be, you know, but that, you know, tends to complicate my life more, but then I, I don't know, it, it's, it's complicated. And I love being big and strong. I love training. Um, but it, yeah, it, it's, it's not easy being a, being a big girl, right? <laughs> right. Well, so. I find it so incredibly profound that you say that when you, that you feel like you, you needed to be smaller to be a woman. And mm -hmm. I think that that's just so ingrained in our society is that women need to be less and women are always trying to be less and, you know, skinnier mm -hmm. or smaller or quieter or something not mm -hmm. noticed or whatever. And it's just so profound that you said that, that you felt like mm -hmm. you needed to try to conform to that, Oh yeah. I felt, I felt a ton of pressure and I, and I still do, but like, I'm very good about recognizing that. And, mm -hmm. um, but no, and, I, and I'm glad you use those words because less is exactly it. And that was one of the things I came to realize and question was why do I feel like I need to make myself less to be a woman? You know, and that is ridiculous. That's absurd, but that's, but, but that's the pressure we're under, you know, mm -hmm. and it is, Oh, don't be too strong. Don't be, don't, you don't even be too smart. I mean, because sometimes it's yeah. threatening to other people's egos and, you know, and like, just for example, an assertive guy is seen as what confident. Oh, he's very confident. Yeah. He's assertive. What's an assertive woman. She's a, a bitch. bitch. Mm -hmm. Yep. Immediately. Oh, what a bitch. You know, like how dare she. And yep. um, it, it's all those things that drive me nuts. And, and, um, 
but yeah, it's just, there's so many double standards and, you know, this whole idea that women should be quiet and be submissive and, you know, not voice their opinion. And, and just, I noticed so much right away too, when I started living as a woman, a majority of the time, um, even at work, even with my friends, even with my male friends that knew me and had known I was trans for a long time, I saw differences in how they treated me and how they reacted towards me when I was presenting as female all the time. And especially after I did lose some weight and got somewhat smaller. And it was like simple things like before, if I asked someone a question, they would just answer my question. Mm -hmm. As a woman, they would often have to show me or come over and do it for me. And I was just like, wow, like, I mean, as if all of a sudden I lost the ability to do what I'd done before, you know, and, um, but yeah, so it was just very frustrating and, um, you know, and it's, you know, things that I'm not telling you guys anything. I mean, it's things with most women deal with all their lives and I'm just over here just saying preach girl. (laughs) Yeah. And, and, um, but yeah, but it's, it's, it's crazy and absurd. And, and for all the people who, and the funny thing is too, the funny thing that struck me too, it isn't just guys that do that. Other women do that too. And I noticed, especially from like the older generations, the women would be very condescending towards other women. And, um, just an example from when I was in pharmacy school and this was well before I was out, but, but I was an intern, um, at a pharmacy in a supermarket and, um, I was a new intern. I was a couple years from graduation and I was still learning a lot. And the pharmacy manager though was a young woman and she looked really young for her age. Um, so she looked even younger than she was. And, um, because of that, because of being female and, and looking young, she did not get the respect she deserved. And there was one time I was waiting on this older lady and she's asking me these questions about her medications and I didn't know the answers. And I kept deferring to my manager who was standing right next to me. And I kept, I said, she's, I'm like, she's the pharmacy manager and she can really answer your question. I'm like, I'm still a student and I'm still learning. I I don't really have the information you're looking for. This woman would not listen to her. She would try to start to explain to her. She would cut her off and then go back to me. And I'm standing there saying, I don't have the answers. She does, but... (laughs) But because she perceived, because I was male and she perceived her as a young woman, she was just in the back of her mind. She had it set that this person knows more than that person simply because of their gender. Yeah. And um, so absurd. And that, and that struck me even back then. It struck me like no matter how hard I tried and I flat out said, like, look, I don't know. She does. And she still wouldn't listen. And um, but, yeah, just so much stuff like that goes on and, and just. Yeah, it's so many of their interactions, but it's that whole idea of somehow that women have to be less to be accepted and to be, you know, um, it's, it's, it's maddening, which I'm, you know, like I said, preaching to the choir, yeah. but, um, but people don't realize, and I think especially a lot of guys don't realize, like, how significant that is. They don't see it because they don't live it. They don't experience it. And maybe if they, especially if they don't do it themselves, but even some of them do it without realizing it. They don't even know yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's just like, you know, just like valuing their opinion less. And, um, you know, especially like with me being into cars, um, I can tell a difference if I'm, if I'm lying and like, or over the phone and I'm speaking to someone and they perceive me as male, my opinion automatically matters a lot more. And they take very, mm-hmm. when I'm talking car stuff over the phone, you know, when I start throwing out a whole bunch of stuff, you know, oh yeah, my engine, you know, it's a 555 cubic inch big block and it has these heads on it and this and that. They're like, oh, right away, well, this person knows what they're talking about, blah, blah, blah. As a girl, I'm still like, they're, they're still questioning me or trying to talk to me like I don't know what I'm talking about. And then if mm-hmm. I'm, and then like with my car, like I have this old 67 Camaro. Oh. If I'm out driving it as a woman, it's, Oh, is that your father's car? Is that your boyfriend's oh. car? <laughs> like it, it's it's crazy. Or people look at you just confused, like what is she doing? Or you even you know even the idea that oh what a waste you know like and it, it's just it, it is it's so crazy and um yeah so it's just like yeah I took my car to the drag strip this summer and I and I was so worried about like how people would perceive me that I went as butched up as I could. I took off all my nail polish and, you know, and looked as manly as I possibly could, which me being as muscular as I am, isn't all that difficult. <laughs> but, um, but I, but I was truly, I, I was afraid that it would just be super awkward and that I would be treated poorly if I tried to show up there, um, as a trans woman. And, um, and, and the funny thing is I made, you know, I made a handful of friends that day at the track and a few of them, um, 
followed me on social media. Like I have, I have different pages for my, I have my, like my car has its own page. <laughs> and, um, That's awesome. but, um, but, I, but a few of the people that went there figured out who I was. And I mean, it's, you know, there's, it's not that hard to do. Um, yeah. but, uh, but, um, and a few of them sent me supportive messages, which was really nice. Cause I, I wasn't sure how people would react, but, but it, yeah, it's one of those things that just as a woman, especially as a trans woman, you're just treated totally differently where if I, I walk in, especially if, especially being a large muscular white male and someone <laughs> who gets perceived as straight, it's like going yeah. from getting all the privilege there is, um, <laughs> right. well, minus the rich part, I guess rich is the only sure. one I, I'm not, I'm not sure. part of yet, but um but then going to be at the opposite end of the spectrum, being an you know an obviously non-passing trans woman, it, it, it's like I feel very fortunate to experience life from those different perspectives because it's opened my eyes <laughs> to so many things. And um, but yeah, it, it's just so many double standards between men and women, and 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 so many men are completely unaware of it, or or they think it's exaggerated, they think it doesn't exist. Yeah, they think that. Like what really drove me nuts was this movement earlier. Um, I don't know, it was about maybe six months ago or so where, um, you know, women were, um, you know, protesting things and, and stuff. And then people were saying, oh, how dare women in America protest anything? They have it so good already. And there were even other women saying, yes. yeah, we have nothing to complain about. And I'm like, oh, my God, are you kidding me? <laughs> I like, saw that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I know exactly what it, you're talking about was like, oh, yeah. what? Well, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, yes, we have it better than other parts of the world. Right. It's not Saudi Arabia. Um, right. but, uh, where women basically have the rights of a pet, but like, it, it's, barely. you know, <laughs> barely. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but it, but still it is as far from equality goes, it's so far from getting there. And that, that's, and that's the thing, like I said, I'm all about truth and, and just equality, you know, like I, I'm not, you know, that's another thing too. People think that, um, you know, feminists, another group that gets a horribly bad rap that doesn't deserve it. And yes, there's some extremists, just like with any other group. But the idea that all feminists are man haters and they're looking to, you know, overthrow, you know, take over and they and they want to feminize all the men in the world and all this crazy stuff. It's like, look, all mo the majority wants is just equal treatment. I mean, it's not that difficult. And And I can't understand anyone that doesn't, you know, it doesn't see why everyone should be treated equal. I mean, sometimes you'll be like, well, you know, men and women are just different and, you know, the man should be the head of the household and everything and all that baloney. And it's just like, really? Like, I mean, it, it's just everyone, I just, you know, equal opportunity, equal treatment, equal rights. It's like, it's not that hard. And, and how, how do you, how do you build a case to, to not be for that? I, I don't understand that. Right. Well, and going back to the car thing, you talk about taking your car to the drag strip and, you know, going butched out, as you said. I I grew up with cars. Um, everyone in my family, all the men in my family, or most of them have been in the car industry. And my husband's really into cars. And so I'm pretty into cars. I like cars a lot. And I, do, I find that even if I go to a car show, I will dress, I will not dress very feminine because it's like perceived like if you are there, you're like supposed to be if you're a woman you're supposed to be like eye candy or something or mm -hmm. like a trophy wife and I I have no interest in doing that like I'm actually there because mm -hmm. I like the cars and so I, I don't I, I will dress you know in like jeans and tennis shoes and like whatever shirt like I will not dress very feminine just because it's like this weird Otherwise, you're mm -hmm. just like looked at as like you're there as an object to be looked at with the cars. I don't know. It's really bizarre. Right. And it's something weird that you kind of talked about that, too, even with your lifting. Like you talked about these qualities that you had um, that made you like a good lifter. Like you're strong and you're like alpha and you're badass. And and but those are not male or female qualities and they don't need to no. be. Um, no, and, and yeah, and it's such a shame that, that those are assigned as masculine qualities, being competitive or being a strong person or having high pain tolerance and, you know, being just quote unquote tough. And, and just look at our language. You know, mm -hmm. when, you know, what do people, when, when someone's trying to encourage someone to tough something out, what do they say? You need to man up. 
Yeah. And if you're being weak, what are, what are you being? You're being a being pussy. A pussy. <laughs> you know, yeah, it, or, you know, or some other kind of derogatory, you know, feminine type term. And, Obviously. Um, yeah, and it's it just, it, it's absurd. But the whole idea that women are weak and need to be submissive and passive, and it's complete bullshit. Strength has nothing to do with gender. There are very, there are very strong men. There are very weak men. There are the same thing with women. And, it, it, yeah, this is just so much that's assigned to gender that has nothing to do with gender. And it's so yeah. frustrating. And like you said, but the women feel all this pressure to act a certain way or look a certain way or be a certain way because they've been conditioned to believe that's how they're supposed to be. And the worst part is, is you see women turning on other women because of that. A muscular mm -hmm. woman walks by and then a group of girls are all whispering, oh my God, look at her. She's so manly. You know, and then that's the worst thing is, is then we're attacking each other and um, it, it's just, it's absurd, but it, it's, yeah, I mean, gosh, you, I mean, we could talk about this for days because it's <laughs> right, so yeah. prevalent in so many ways. And, and, um, but yeah, and, that, and that's what I don't want to see. That, those are the things I want to see change. I mean, people just have to think about, is this, if you have daughters, is this the kind of world you want them to be in? Is that how you'd like them perceived? And especially I want to ask the fathers out there that, treat women that way or you know cat call a woman when she walks by or you know or use some demeaning terms or you know do all these things or you know value women's opinion less or think that they're supposed to be submissive or weak is that what is that how you want someone treating your daughter is that the kind of world you want them to grow up in would you want a guy to treat your daughters the way you treat other women i mean it's things you need to stop and think about and um but yeah i mean i think but i think we are making progress i think things are moving in the right direction um, not fast enough, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it just, it, you know, unfortunately it's being talked about, it is becoming more, and there's always a pushback when things like this come up initially, there's always a pushback before real progress is made. And, yeah. um, I, I mean, I definitely think we're getting there and, um, but it's just, we're so obsessed with gender and, and, um, I mean, what's the first question everyone asks when someone's pregnant, boy or girl? Why is that so important? Why is that the number one question, the most important thing anyone has to know? You know, why? We, we do that without even thinking, you know, mm -hmm. and, but, but why? What's the reason behind it? It's because we've been conditioned to believe that males and females are so different and they need to be treated different. And I, and I see that. Um, you see that with young girls. What, what are they told, like, from a the time they're very little, by the time they're two, three-year-old? What, what are people telling them? Oh, you're so pretty. It's, you know, you're this, you're that. And, oh, you, you're such a little princess. And it's, but it's all about their looks. It's, and it's all about being attractive or being seen as attractive to whoever is, you know, whoever's doing the looking. But um, what are little boys told? You know, they fall down and start crying. Don't cry. Be tough. You know, be this, be that. You know, don't show emotions. And there's so much thrown onto people based on their gender. And it has nothing to do with being masculine, feminine, male, or female. And, um, you know, it's a, it's so absurd that we have colors that are assigned to genders. I mean, how does that even happen? Like, what the heck does that have to do with anything? You know, and, um, but yeah, just as a culture and as a society, we're obsessed with gender and this idea that our gender determines so much, so much about who we are and how we should behave. And, and that's just simply not true. I mean, yeah. I, you know, really, what does feminine and masculine even mean? I mean, you know, like... If you if you you know go look at stereotypically masculine, there are a lot of women out there that are extremely masculine. There's a lot of men yep. that are extremely feminine. So how yep. is that even an accurate description when men and women both have these wide ranges that go from one end of the spectrum to the other? So I mean, how is that man being woman like when he's just being who he is? And how is that woman being male like when she's just being who she is? You know, and, and the ideas of what comprises that changes all the time. It's completely arbitrary. You know, 50 or 60 years ago, it wasn't considered okay for a woman to wear a pair of pants. And, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and the stuff. And now, like, the level of CrossFit, you know, one good thing CrossFit has really done is helped popularize the idea of muscular women being more acceptable. And um, the idea of what is, you know, and this is still total baloney, what is okay, how muscular it is okay for to be a woman, that's drastically changed in the last 10 or 20 years. And really, yeah. there is no okay. I mean, it, what's okay for a woman, how muscular? As muscular as she wants to be, you know, like, <laughs> and, um, but, uh, but yeah, but those things are constantly evolving. They're constantly changing. They're purely subjective. 
And it, and it varies but from culture to culture. It varies from person to person. You walk up to the street, even in the same culture, with people from the same backgrounds, and ask them their opinion on these questions, you'll get different answers. So the whole thing is just, it, it, it's completely absurd, completely subjective. And the, and the biggest problem is, is because it hurts so many people on a daily basis. It affects so many yes. people, how they live their lives, how they feel about themselves, their own self-esteem. And I know because I struggled with that for so long. And to be honest, I still do. I mean, I still do. I'm, I mean, I'm a very confident person in a lot of ways, but I'm not going to lie. There's a lot of days I look in the mirror and I'm not happy with what I see and I feel <laughs> conflicted and I'm still fighting against all these prejudices I've grown up with and been, you know, socialized it with. And, and um, it, it's still hard for me. You know, I'm still I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to wear at the film festival <laughs> next week and how people are going to perceive me and what kind of message I'm trying to send and, and how this looks on my body. And, um, you know, so it, it's just, you know, it's very, very difficult and much, much more so for women than for men. Yeah. Well, well uh, join the club, bro. I mean, yeah. shit. But I want to – so what you're saying, the whole be less, don't be less, be more sort of thing – I think mm -hmm. a lot of men and a lot of women in society very much fear the female strength community simply because mm -hmm. we stopped caring. We're just a dangerous group of women together because we're like, yeah, girl, go be fucking strong. You want to do a bikini competition? You do the fuck you want to do. It doesn't matter. Right. If you love you, that's all that matters. And I think that that's, mm -hmm. as that is growing, it's terrifying a lot of people. But then a lot of women are jumping on board. They're like, oh, you mean I can be me and it's okay? It's like this new concept to people. And it is insane to me that that's where we are in society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's always funny how um, change can be so threatening, especially when you take a group that has been marginalized or has been treated as less. And now they're starting to, you know, hey, no, no, we're just, I'm just as good as you are. And it has nothing to do with my gender. Well, that's threatening. And I, and I made a comment, um, well, threatening to a lot of people. Yes. And, or, but I, um, I, had, I had heard this somewhere else, and, and I don't remember who said it or where I heard it. I, I actually, I read it somewhere. But um, it said, when you're, when, you're, um, when you're used to privilege, equality can feel like oppression. And that's mm -hmm. like, you know, so that's, people find it very threatening because they're used to being you know, treated with all this privilege and with these special things. And when, when, when another group that they're used to being seen as more than all of a sudden is saying, Hey, no, we're equal and, and getting that they find it threatening and they feel, and that's in your huge ridiculous arguments, you know, and all these groups springing up and, you know, save men and, and, um, and, uh, oh, and I've had a couple of conversations with my buddies about that stuff. And, you know, and just this idea that feminism is destroying the world and they seek to, you know, <laughs> er eradicate the manly man and, and all this stuff. And, and, um, but yeah, like I said, when you're used to privilege, equality can feel like oppression. And especially when people don't, you know, they feel like they're losing something, even though they're not. And, um, and it just takes being rational and being open-minded and realizing like, Hey, yeah, allowing, you know, um, another group to be treated equally. There's nothing wrong with that. It, it's not going to take anything away from someone who doesn't belong to that group. And, right. um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it's strong women are definitely threatening because you're stepping outside the bounds of what's considered okay. And, right. and especially when, you know, we're seeing a lot of women that are, you know, very confident in that and, and it's like, Hey, this is me and I don't care. And then, and it freaks people out. And, um, right. but, uh, but, it, it, but it's awesome that so many girls are feeling that confidence and are feeling more comfortable to, to, to pursue the things that makes them happy. And especially if strength training is one of them, I mean, yeah, more power to you for sure. So I'm curious how lifting has played, like weightlifting, powerlifting, being a bodybuilder, how just um, all of your training has played a role in your like coming to terms with, because you talk about, you say you grew up um, like white trash and that you yeah, kind of I get had, a lot of flack for saying that, but but you had these, you had like negative thoughts about people that are like you. And so how did that like play a role in your lifting at all? Like, was that like, it was lifting like, like solace for you or was that kind of like made things a little bit more difficult for you to understand? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and that's a good question. And it's something that took me a long time to figure out. And I don't know that um, I still have it 100% figured out, but um, 
so I went through this really crazy process. It was a really good thing, but, um, but it was very difficult. So when I first started really dealing with all of my transgender feelings, like, you know, a little over a decade ago, it was like I was waking up and not sure who I was. I mean, at all. I felt like I was this person that was completely artificial. And I, and I had to ask myself, I'm like, have I completely constructed who I am? Is any of this real? Is it me? And it was such a weird thing to wake up one day and be like, I don't know who I am. And I, and I really didn't like, and, um, and at first I assumed, um, and I had been told by other, you know, some other people too, which didn't help, which confused me more, but people were, you know, when, when I came out as trans and then I had people telling me that, you know, sometimes other trans women, sometimes even therapists and other things, well, you did all those things. You did all those macho things to compensate for who you really are. So then at first I started to accept that. I'm like, okay, well, the lifting was just, it was a protection. It was a shield. And, and it did protect me in some ways. Like I said, it helped me feel less vulnerable. But for me, after time, I really did realize it was just something I was always passionate about. And whether I'm a woman who loves strength training or it's more complicated than that, I was definitely passionate about strength training, always have been, always will be. But it took, it took me quite a while to figure that out. Like, is this just compensation for trying to hide who I really am? And, but then there's that idea tied in there that me lifting was compensating for being female. So again, that lifting was anti-feminine. And, um, but, uh, but yeah, but then like joining the Marines and doing all these stereotypical masculine things, it was a long process of basically tearing myself down and saying, what is real and what have I created? And, and what I really found out, all the things I liked, I really liked. Um, but what I, I had been suppressing a whole lot, there was just a whole lot of me that I never allowed to see the light of day. All the things I enjoyed and just being myself. And th th one of the things that really um, stuck out at me was, like I said, like I was very uncomfortable always trying to play a masculine role in a relationship. And even though like I was attracted to women, um, it never felt right. And it would, always made me extremely uncomfortable, always like, and, and I would get so frustrated. And the more attracted I was to someone, the more difficult it was. And um, it would just, I would get really, and I, and I was, a, you know, I've always been a pretty social person and, and I'm fairly confident in other ways, but I would get in these intimate interactions and just be completely lost and not have any idea what I was supposed to do, what was expected of me, or even the things I knew I was supposed to do made me really uncomfortable. So that was a really difficult process. And, um, but the lifting was it really, it's just a big part of who I am, just like any other woman who loves strength training or loves getting bigger and stronger. Um, but it, it was a difficult process trying to tear all that down. And, and there were times I definitely overdid the macho thing for a period of time, especially probably during the Marine Corps. And, you know, I, I was, you know, one of the things I was extremely sensitive that anything that was considered feminine, I wouldn't even wear a pair of male dress shoes that looked anything like any women's shoes or anything at all. I think it made me feel really vulnerable. And I think it made me feel like I was being exposed. Mm -hmm. Like people could see what was really going on. And I was so terrified at that time in my life. I was so terrified that someone would find, figure out I was trans or that, you know, that I had issues with my gender and all this stuff. And um, I, I mean, you know, back then when I grew up um, and where I grew up, I was conditioned to believe that being gay was like the worst thing in the world. I mean, just cool. absolutely horrible. And then, and then, so if, if being gay was that bad, what the heck were people going to think about being transgender? I mean, it was like on a whole other level. And so like, even the sad thing is, even by the time I was five or six years old, I knew I couldn't tell my parents. I knew I couldn't tell people. I was terrified to death of what someone would think if they knew. And there were times I would do silly things. And, um, and one time I, I found a tube of lipstick and I snuck off in the woods, like way deep in the woods just to try it on. And then I was like, you know, then I'm paranoid. Like, I'm like, oh my God, is there somebody out here that could be seeing me right now? And I was totally freaking out about it. <laughs> and, um, but uh, it was just, you know, and I, I thought it was never out of my mind for five minutes of any day. Like I would, I would get extremely uncomfortable just walking through a department store because I wanted to go over to the makeup. I wanted to go to the women's clothes and shoes and purses. And, and I was always interested in those things. But I was terrified that if I did anything like that, I would somehow be outing myself and, every, and I'd be exposed. And Halloween, oh my God, as a child, Halloween was torture for me. I hated Halloween and I quit going when I was 10 years old 
because every year I wanted to dress up like a princess or just even a little girl or anything like that. But I was too terrified to ask for it. And I was too afraid of what, you know, that I would be exposing myself or someone would question why, why in the world would you want to do that? You know? And um, I remember one year my mom was thinking about um, dressing my little brother up as a girl and then inside I'm going me, 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 please, please, please. <laughs> And she didn't do it, and but I was it tortured me so bad because the whole time I wanted to say something, and um, but I, I couldn't bring myself to do it, and it would make me so uncomfortable. And it, just putting on any kind of costume really weirded me out. And um, so at, yeah, by the time I was ten, I, I told my parents I, I I don't like Halloween and I, I'm not going to go out anymore. And they were kind of like okay, and they thought I was I was always into being healthy and exercising and working out, and I really wasn't a big candy person. So they just assumed, oh, you know, they don't want candy and it's no big deal. But no, it was the dressing up part that tormented me because, yeah, I wanted to dress in something extremely feminine and um, and I, I couldn't handle that pressure. And I was too terrified to say anything. And looking back, I, I unfortunately, I was right to feel that way because if I had said, hey, mom, I want to be a princess, well, it would have been like, <laughs> what? Like, and uh, and I'm sure I, I, you know, and if I had been honest about how I felt, I probably would have ended up in shock therapy or who knows what, you know. Oh God. Yeah, it was. It would not have been good. And even no. now, like, I mean, you probably saw it with the trailer. Like, my parents. I mean, they've known for quite a while. I told my mom, you know, ten years ago, but they they still struggle with it, you know. And I understand yeah. some of it. I mean, they're they're afraid of losing the person that they've known all their lives and they love. But, um, but you know, they're just small town people and old school and, and um, they just don't get it. They don't understand. And, and I think it's hard too because like my dad, like in the documentary, this part, my dad, they're talking to him and he says, you know, he just, he talks about how I've always been so macho and how that's all I did was all the sports and all those things. He never had any idea of all these things I was hiding inside. And, and, I, and I, after watching that, I wanted to say to him, like, look, there's a whole bunch more there, but I never felt comfortable sharing that with you. And, and to be honest, I still don't. It, it's just, um, my dad still has yet to see me with makeup and stuff on. Um, I don't see him that often. I only see him a couple times a year, but um, it's it just, I know it's going to make him really uncomfortable and it'll be awkward for me. And, and at this point, I guess it just hasn't been worth it to me or, ha or maybe, I don't know, I'm trying to give him more time or take it slower. With, with my mom, I finally, after years and years of, um, you know, wanting her to, to see me as Janae, I, I finally went and visited her last summer and that, that's shown in the documentary too. And it was, it was hard. It was still awkward. And, and, um, you know, she, I know my parents love me. I mean, I know they're not going to like, yeah. you know, never see me again or whatever, but it, it's still, but I also know they're not thrilled about it. I know mm -hmm. that if they could snap their fingers and, you know, make it all go away. They definitely would. And, and that's hard. That's hard knowing that, you know, knowing that as a person that, um, but, uh, but it is what it is. And, and that's the pressure that society exerts upon people to, you know, not be okay with people being themselves. And it's, especially when you're, you know, you're outside, um, you know, what's considered quote unquote normal, which again, I think is completely Nor the, normal is an illusion. Um, yes. I, I, I define normal as the self that we feel comfortable sharing with the rest of the world that we feel will be accepted. Because, I mean, let's be honest, oh all God. of us are, are weird in our own ways. All of us have our yeah. things we hide and we all have our things that we're afraid other people wouldn't accept or would think poorly of us if we showed. So we all do it. It's just my stuff was just maybe a little bit more shocking than most, <laughs> but, um, but we all do that. And, and that's one thing I want everyone, like, you don't have to be trans. You don't have to, you don't even have to be a woman that wants to be big and strong. It could be any way that you feel like you're different or you feel, you don't feel comfortable being you. That, that's why I want people to understand, you know what, be you because you are in the end, you're going to be so much more happier and you're going to live so much more of a full life you know, versus hiding all this stuff, trying to make other people happy that for something, for a reason that's probably not even significant. Mm -hmm. But, um, well, yeah. so tell us about your movie because, um, it's, mm -hmm. you have a documentary coming out at the Austin film festival really soon. And by the time, but by the time everyone's listening to this, it will have already happened because it's happening super soon. Yep. So yep. tell Next us about it. Okay, so the um, so the documentary was filmed over the last two years of my life, um, basically from the time um, I was outed publicly. I um, 
the funny, it's kind of funny how it all happened too, because um, the vi- one of the videographers and actually one of the, the video guys from that helped film the documentary, he had um, done some freelance work and filmed me when I was still with Muscle Tech. And so I had met him and met him and his wife actually. And um, so then I, when I, and this was actually probably only less than six months before I was outed. And then, so when I was outed, he heard about my story, you know, recognized me and then contacted the director and said, Hey, you should really look into this person. And so that's how it all got started, got contacted by the director. And, and, um, you know, we discussed a lot of things. I wanted to know what, you know, his idea his vision was. And Mm -hmm. I was very clear that like, look, I, I don't, I'm not somebody who's worried about being like a celebrity or anything like that. What matters to me is I want, if I'm going to tell my story, I want, I'm hoping to inspire people like me and educate people that don't understand. I said, if we can do those two, two things, then I'm, I'm totally on board. I said, but if we can't do that, and if this is going to be sensationalized or it's going to be shown in a negative light in any way, then I'm not interested at all. And I, I don't care what, you know, is being offered or any of that stuff. And, and I, and I, I really feel like the director's heart was in the right place. And, and, um, so yeah, so the film airs uh, next week at, at the Austin, it'll make its premiere at the Austin Film Festival. Um, and it shows on Saturday the 28th and then again on Monday the 30th of October. And um, like you said, by the time this is posted, that'll already have happened. And it will air, It's it's got to finish making its run of the film festivals. And, and I'm still waiting on a lot of details, so I don't know everything right now. Um, but it's got to complete the film festivals before it'll air on TV. There, it, it is going to air on the CBC network in Canada. Um, and there's other networks that are interested, but I'm still, as far as like showing it internationally or being online and things like that, and I'm, I'm still waiting to hear all the details on that. But of course, I'm hopeful that everyone that wants to see it will be able to see it at some point and, um, and hopefully sooner rather than later. And I will, um, on my social media, I'll post about all those things as they become available to me. But, but yeah, I'm excited and hopeful that, um, like I said, it, it inspires and educates people and, and Hopefully my story helps, um, you know, help people think about this differently, helps fight some of the myths and some of the negative stuff that's thought about trans people that's not true. And, and this is just a small snapshot. I mean, it's really yeah. the last two year period. And it really has a lot to do with me with struggling, you know, with transition, whether or not to, and then this idea of, you know, losing, you know, it does show me like, and you'll notice in the film, sometimes I'm bigger, sometimes I'm smaller. Like I gain and lose weight a few times as I'm kind of struggling with all of this. And, um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I hope people like it. I hope they find it inspiring and, and, um, you know, and I'm hoping to meet a lot of people through this and, and hopefully it'll open some doors for me to be more of a voice in the world about these kind of things. So if people want to watch the trailer, cause we watched it and it was super good. And I'm like, I just, Aww. I want to like a fly to Austin so I can see this movie ASAP, but it's transformerfilm.com. Is that what it is? Correct. Mm-hmm. Transformer yep, correct. And, Yep. Yep. And then I have the, you know, links to the posted on my, um, my Instagram account has the link. And, um, and then I did post, you guys probably saw, I posted the trailer in three parts in on my mm-hmm. Instagram and Facebook, um, which is Janae Marie Croc. Um, but, uh, but yeah, transformerfilm.com is the official website and it premieres uh, last weekend in October down in Austin. Okay. So we've already taken up so much of your time and I feel like we could talk about this for forever. Um, <laughs> so sure. one final question and then we'll mm-hmm. call that good for this round. And we, you know, doors open for another round because there's so I'd many love other to. questions. Sure. So final question. Mm-hmm. What do you wish that Janae now knew 10 years ago when you first started transitioning, when you first kind of accepted yourself and all that? What do you wish you knew? To not be so afraid of being myself. Um, Love it. That, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm going to get choked up now. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that it'll turn out a lot better than I thought it would. Um, you know, it, that it won't be easy. And there's definitely going to be some bumps in the road. And, and there'll be some things that'll be difficult. But, um, but it'll definitely be worth it. And that, um, yeah, I'll be way happier and, um yeah, but basically just, and I, I would say that message for anyone, you know, don't be afraid to be who you are. And um, I, I tried to be someone who doesn't think about regrets and not about what ifs because we can't change the past. Um, but uh, but we definitely can control what we do today to affect our future. And 
but yeah, don't put off. If, if there's something, you know, like that you're dealing with, and it, it may not be being trans or, you know, even being a female weightlifter or, you know, or LGBT or anything like that. But if there's something about your life, a part of you that you're hiding or something that you're passionate about that you're afraid to pursue, don't be, you know, get out there and do it. The sooner you do it, the better you're going to feel. And the more you're going to realize like, gosh, why did I wait so long? And, um, and I think that applies to so many things for so many people, but it's just, you know, if you're passionate about something and, and or if there's something about yourself that, you know, you're hiding, um, don't, um, you know, love who you are, be who you are. And, and like, you know, the one thing I had said before, never let anyone else make you feel like there's something wrong with you because they don't understand you. Um, that's not, you know, it's not your job to make everyone else comfortable with who you are. So true. Well, I can say that in the two hours that we've gotten to speak to you, I think Chris and I both can say that you're a wonderful human and we are just oh, honored that you. you're here. So where yes. can everyone find you? Where can um, Okay. You know, social media, um, like most people these days, um, <laughs> Janae Marie Crack on Instagram and um, Facebook. It, you can, if you search Janae Marie Crack, I'm sure you'll find my page, but it's under I, a long time ago when I first opened the Facebook page, um, I used a, you know, different name, and, and so sometimes it comes up under Melissa Moore. That was my alias for a short period of time. And, uh, Did you say and, Melissa uh, with an M or an A? Alyssa or uh, Melissa? Melissa, yeah, Melissa Moore <laughs> was, was, was my early alias before, um, you know, before Janae came to life. But, uh, <laughs> but, yeah, and then on Twitter, too. But to be honest, I'm not real active on Twitter. I, I read other people's Twitter's stuff. Okay. I don't yeah it's I'm more of an Instagram girl like I don't know you know like it's just and it's easier just to tag the other stuff and and um but uh I do have a new website in development and stuff too but uh, I'll post more about that when all that's ready and a lot of irons in the fire right now lots of lots of stuff going on which is all exciting but a little hectic a little stressful too but um but uh but yeah yeah no I'm, I'm really excited about the future like it's things are a little rough but that's you know that's how they always are before things get better and and um but no it, it's a very exciting time and I, I just feel very fortunate to be in the position i'm in and have the opportunities that i have and, and i just really hope to make the most of them we love that's it awesome. and we'll make sure everyone for everyone who's listening all that will be linked in the show notes so go check it out Thank you so much for coming on and I'm going to bug you probably in a few weeks for a part two, because like I said, there's so many things that we need to talk about. <laughs> oh, for sure. And I would love to be, you know, thank you so much for having me on tonight and I would love to be on as, as long as you guys want to listen to me, I'm, I'm happy to keep talking. <laughs> oh so, yeah. I was um, just quiet yeah. this whole time. So I was like, just, <laughs> oh my God, just soaking it all in. So you're so inspiring. So I love, I love what you're doing. So, so thank awesome. you so we'll much. Stay in touch.